as we are commemorating the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence towards women and girls, I am particularly pleased to have Ifra Ahmed talk with us today about her experience of female genital mutilation. Good morning, Ifra. Good morning, Lydia. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to St. Bridget's Church. Would you tell our audience about your journey to Ireland? Yeah, thank you, uh, first of all, for having me. Um, as you said, I am Ifra Ahmed, and we discuss on uh, female genital mutilation. I came to Ireland as a refugee in, back in 2006. And um, because of uh, my country of origin, Somalia has been a war. And that is why I left and came into Ireland as a refugee. I don't know really where to begin because, you know, I built my new life in Ireland and I, I, I moved on with it. So, yeah, I suppose back in um, coming from uh, a war torn country to you didn't you didn't plan on coming to Ireland. I remember you, you said but you ended up here. Yes. <laughs> But you see, I always say that Ireland is a great country and that's why I say I'm very proud that I am an Irish citizen today. And um, you talked about when you arrived in Ireland, I suppose the usual procedure is, is that you undergo a medical examination. Yes, that actually brings into on um, female genital mutilation. As, um, in Ireland, uh, every refugee who arrives the country goes through a medical check. And I was one of uh, those refugees who were told that they have to go through an examination. So I remember going to the hospital and first time uh, I was told that I have to do some uh, smear test, which I never know what means of uh, smear test because uh, in my country, the women who go through on women's general check are the women who are married and who had the babies and things like that. But in Ireland was different because you're a refugee, you come from countries that where most of the people think uh, it affected HIV AIDS or malaria or, you know, different type of diseases. So I remember was asked um, what happened to me and how does it happen and who did it and all that kind of things. and. I find it really uncomfortable, all those questions, because it was a personal um, experience and it was a, really, it was a personal thing. I find out that the people who were examined, they did not know anything about uh, female genital mutilation. And if I talk about a bit on female genital mutilation is FGM is practiced almost all African countries, some Asian countries and some, uh, you know, even we hear that there is in some North America, but we know Africa and some of the Asian countries. So around the world, 200 million women worldwide are at um, on risk of FGM. And in Ireland, we know that um, there are 3,000 and more women are undergoing FGM. And they are, now we don't know the community because uh, if you counted, I think we will have more people from, especially Somalia, where I come from, there will be more than 3,000 people in the country now because when we look at uh, and estimate that it was made in 2012 and now is 2020, is different. So, um, but FGM is practiced Somalia 98%. Young girls have gone through, uh, have, have gone through an FGM. And also, uh, it has not really in place in Islam. And now I am speaking to uh, you ladies in the charge and all that, uh, you know, I'm a Muslim, but uh, I believe that uh, all kinds of religious uh, peace and, um, you know, we, we should respect. So FGM has no in place in Islam or Christian because in Nigeria, there are some Christian people who practice. And Somalia, where 98% uh, women are cut, um, are Muslim, uh, 100%. So uh, it has not in place in Islam, but it's still it's happening. And this is a cultural practice and a belief of a mother who sees that she was cut and she has to cut her own daughter. So sometimes I see like, is it like a revenge? Because... Uh, 
when we say that it has no healthy benefit, it means women who undergo an FGM, they can face a lot of health consequences. One, women can have a kidney failure. Two, women can actually die for bleeding. And when they give birth or even during the cutting. So it's, it, it, there is nothing in there for them. So for me, as um, getting my examination in Ireland, I have become the voice because I see that the people in Ireland, they were kind of, I don't know if I have to say ignorance because of the practice, but people did not really understand of what female genital mutilation is. In yeah. this case, I was a refugee with other 19, 18 young women from different countries in Africa who have gone through female genital mutilation as I did. So I had the opportunity to go to them and speak and then finding out one of the girl who was from uh, somewhere in Guinea-Bissau, she said that she was cut in a broken glass. So then I say we should speak to Irish people and explain this is our culture. And this is how I begin on my activism in Ireland, talking about female genital mutilation. And I'm happy that now today, you know, a lot of people are aware of on FGM. What age um, are girls usually when this is performed? It, it, it can be zero to eight and nine, and sometimes it's up to 15. Depend how the family wanted the girls to go to run. So getting your voice, um, I remember you said to us that you felt as a refugee that here, here was one country where you felt you had a voice. And how did that uh, help you begin your campaign? When I started the campaign, the community was so angry with me because they felt that I was shaming on them. And not necessarily they are Somalis, but they are from country where the FGM is practiced. So in this case, I felt that I was I was at risk from people. You know, uh, they might do something to me and something like that. Then I remember when I first came to Ireland, I was told, "Now you're in a safe country, and nothing will happen to you." And I was told that I can speak freely. In this case. When I ran away from Dublin because of what people have said and what people say, when people told me they're going to kill me because I was speaking out on female genital mutilation, that is when I felt that I found in my own voice because I was told that you are in Ireland and you are in free country and you can speak. And that is how I begin finding myself. And so what did you do next? Um, I started within the Somalian community on speaking on FGM. And then uh, when I started with the community, that it's it was very, um, it was very uh, what I say. It was actually diverted within the community because we were on the newspaper and the people were not happy. So it was not uh, well received by me by the community. But uh, at least it opened the door for me that I can speak. So I just continued doing it and speaking. And then I set up a youth club called the United Europe of Ireland. And I feel that maybe in this way, we can raise awareness and we continue raising awareness within the uh, United Europe of Ireland. You set up a foundation called the IFRA Foundation. I did, uh, yeah, because you see, I met a beautiful woman called Sammy Leslie. And I remember sitting somewhere and Sami asked me because of the activities I was doing, I mean, like uh, if I was belong to any association or any organization. So I told her that I was just me doing all these activities and Sami and other members like Coraline Keeling and also the director of the movie called A Girl from Mogadishu. And other people actually decide to help set up uh, the foundation uh, called the IFRA Foundation, where IFRA Foundation, our vision is uh, absolutely abandoning on FGM in Somalia and Horn of Africa, collaboration with all other partners who are working on the, on the, uh, on FGM. And then what we do is actually, you know, um, we have pillar of um, empowering, and then we have um, 
women empowerment, and then we have a religious leaders, and then we have um, religious leaders, and then we have a media. So we do community awareness and we do advocacy. And then also we are trying to actually fight FGM to legislate in Somalia. Well, thanks very much, uh, Ifra. Um, is there anything else you want to say? No, um, thank you so much for having me. I think it is great, you know, uh, to have a different voice in it. And I hope uh, everybody listens there. Um, you know, sometimes I say that every little helps because Tesco say every little helps. So, you know, our foundation, uh, everyone can actually get involved, you know, sharing the message on your social media, your platform, it helps to raise awareness. And also uh, anyone can help for donation. Our foundation is www.ifrafoundation.org. And also we are on uh, Twitter and we are on Facebook and on Instagram as well. And I hope uh, you can learn more and you can uh, receive more information and you can also uh, visit our website. So thank you so much for, for having me and I hope uh, all your events around the world on the 16th day activism goes well for you guys. That was Ifra Ahmed, founder of the Ifra Nation, which supports women who've experienced female genital mutilation. And also it's um, an advocacy and a campaigning group to change attitudes and to outlaw the practice of female genital mutilation worldwide.